social justice, critical race theory, white privilege, white guilt, racial identity. We don't teach that. That's not about slavery. That's not about something that happened 200 years ago. That is one of John MacArthur's three sprawling homes. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What is highly esteemed among men? Empires, book deals, massive auditoriums, tennis courts perhaps, a prefix of doctor, a study Bible with your name stamped on it. What, what is a biblical and Christ-proclaiming view of Charlottesville, of Charlottesville, Virginia, and all that's happened recently? Sure. Um, I'll give you a biblical view of it. Um, the human heart is desperately wicked. And the human heart is hostile toward God and self-centered and proud and selfish and angry. That's just your way of saying all sin is the same. And we all should be held accountable for our own actions only and forget the sins of our forefathers. What Charlottesville simply demonstrates is that fallen humanity is corrupt. All I see in that is the justification of anger. Look, that's, that's not about slavery. That's not about something that happened 200 years ago. That's an opportunity for angry, hostile, self-willed, selfish people to explode and feel good about it because they can get away with it when there's enough of them, too many of them, to stop. No one tolerates white supremacists. When I was down in Mississippi years ago, I was arrested by those kinds of people for preaching the gospel in black high schools, and I was put in jail, and they took all my money away. John MacArthur comes across as an austere, sincere man of convictions. But the more I hear his doctrine, I realize he only has a form of godliness. Okay, you do not serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Otherwise, you would never suggest that white supremacy is not tolerated by anybody. What type of vague statement is that? And you would never have stated that your money was taken away how many years ago? Okay, that's the only persecution that you have to give testimony of? Is your money being taken away? Dude, some have receipts that you're a millionaire 90 times over. You are rich. You have your reward. I, I know that. I was with the black leaders in Jackson, Mississippi in... And Charles Evers, Medgar Evers' brother, Charles was the first black mayor in the South. Charles, his brother Medgar was the first martyr of the Civil Rights Movement. He was killed. I was in the room when Martin Luther King was assassinated with those black leaders. And we went to Memphis and I stood on the blood spots on that motel with those men. And I stood in the little bathroom on top of the toilet where James Earl Ray shot him out the window. Those men were my friends. That was my community. I couldn't buy groceries in that town when I got back. I, in Mendenhall, Mississippi, I couldn't eat in a restaurant. I, I've seen all that. Everyone is friends with Dr. King after he died. How many slaves did your grandfather own, John MacArthur? How many of your closest friends who look like you are deans and presidents of the master's universities and seminary schools? Is it a coincidence that the Shepherds Conference that you attend, all of its hosts look like you, and you only took in Vody Balkum to claim affirmative action as a smokescreen, using him as the lone black spokesman to deny or condemn those who adhere to the doctrine of recompense? Explain how you and your predominantly Caucasian congregation inherited that slave money as the root of the grace to you multi-million dollar empire. 
That's, that's not what's going on there in Charlottesville or any of these other demonstrations. This is the wretched, fallen human heart feeling like it can rise to any level that is not completely controlled. And let me tell you what gets you there. Number one, the human heart is evil. War is in the heart. Men will kill. That's how they function. But God has built three restraints into society. Restraint number one is in the individual, and it's the conscience. But the conscience reacts to a moral law. So if you have a whole generation of young people that have been taught a twisted, perverted, inverted, upside down and backwards moral law, then their conscience can't function. The, the conscience is, is simply a recognition mechanism that says that's wrong, that's right, that excuses and accuses. But it only can function where there's a sound moral law written in the heart. So you have a whole generation of these people, this generation, who have had a totally perverted sense of what morality is. And the dominant part of this new morality is, I'm the most important person in the world. It's all about me. It's the selfie culture. So conscience is now crippled. Secondly, God put fathers and mothers in a family to bring a rod to discipline people in order to subdue their evil. If the family is destroyed and the family breaks down, then you have no control over those people. So conscience can't function because the moral law has been literally destroyed. Families don't function, so there is no discipline learned. There's no sense of what is right, what is acceptable behavior. Okay, I agree with all of that. But as usual, you are very vague. Yes, the individual will be judged by God and men according to his or her deeds. But God will judge Esau for his crafty counsel, along with the Gentile nations saying, let us cut them off from being a people, according to the scriptures. They say, let us deal wisely with them. The let's circulate drugs into their communities, then come back to prosecute them and incarcerate the so-called black man for selling drugs. Let's exploit their free prison labor and watch them kill one another in the prisons. Let's even pay their women to prostitute themselves through the corrupt child support system while our judges and lawyers get filthy rich off their calamities. Let us establish seminary schools to cover up the wicked, abominable deeds of our forefathers. Let's hire Negroes like Vody Balkum to come to our defense against those who cry out for reparations. We will teach a vague, moral of the story gospel. So when they hear of the rich young ruler, even that applies to everybody. Give us the intricacies of your sins, dude. The most high waiting on your repentance, bearing worthy works of repentance. And the only institution left that God ordained was the police. And the police were given a sword to subdue those who do evil. When you assault the police long enough that you diminish their authority and the sense of fear and the sense of reverence that a society has to have for those who police them, then all hell will break loose. Conscience isn't functioning, family's not functioning, and the police have been stripped of their powers in the social consciousness. You literally have unleashed the human heart at its worst level. This is not about race, and this is not about what happened in America in the past. No one can tolerate white supremacists. No one can tolerate the Ku Klux Klan. One of my dear friends, John Perkins, his brother was killed in front of him by the Ku Klux Klan in the street. No one can tolerate that. That is just one manifestation of the evil of the human heart. And we have only begun to see it once it's unleashed and it's going to start coming in all kinds of forms. 
because of the breakdown of moral law, the breakdown of the conscience, the breakdown of the family, and because of the incessant assaults on governing authorities. Very selective and prisoner of the moment with societal sins that is a threat to your own comfort. I see right through you, dude. <laughs> I support the police too, but a false balance is an abomination. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. My name is Joshua, and that is one of John MacArthur's three sprawling homes. You heard that right, three. And I'm willing to bet you don't have a tennis court on yours. Mr. Anti-Prosperity himself appears to be living the lavish millionaire lifestyle of your run-of-the-mill prosperity preacher and to a degree even more opulent than some of the worst. Indeed, if you do a little bit of cursory research, John MacArthur's net worth uh, far exceeds some notable names. Uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, Jesus speaking, uh, beginning in verse 13, says this, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and and despise the other, you cannot serve God and mammon, or money. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And as he mentioned at the start of this video, MacArthur has received acclamation, praise from men. He's lived in luxury for more than 40 years. The scriptures also say, woe to you when men speak well of you, when all men speak well of you. Okay, woe to those who laugh now, for you shall weep later. The objections immediately begin coming. Ah, uh, well, John MacArthur didn't make his money like the health and wealth and prosperity people by lying to them or conning them into, you know, some outrageous doctrine. John MacArthur just happened to get rich by saying different things. But he said true things, and that makes it better. Well, I will concede that John MacArthur has said many true things. Uh, I will go further and say that compared to... Uh, Kenneth Copeland, for example, um, John MacArthur stands in stark contrast, at least on paper, at least in word, uh, to the things that Kenneth Copeland espouses. Um, but even doctrinally speaking, there are many people who shockingly took no issue with John MacArthur saying you can take the mark of the beast and still be saved. This is not a light issue. This is ridiculous, and it is as damnable as anything Kenneth Copeland preaches. Facts. Also, a lot of his false doctrine is simply through omission. He stays away from the books of Deuteronomy, Malachi, Obadiah, Isaiah, Amos. Okay, most heretics stay in the New Testament and refuse to address the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. So forth. John MacArthur has been a proven hypocrite for a long time, but there's something about financial impropriety that even the world loathes. Remember the Bible says what? You will know them by their fruits. When the fruit of a ministry is nepotism, corruption, covetousness, kickbacks, and potential illegality, which we're going to get into, you will know them by their fruits. Behold the fruit of John MacArthur. Yet according to a financial statement and uh, financial statements and tax forms obtained by the Roy's Report, John MacArthur and his family preside over a religious media and educational empire that has over $130 million in assets and generates more than $70 million a year in tax-free revenue. Again, most people aren't surprised, but when you see the numbers in black and white, well, it's kind of shocking. But listen, MacArthur and his family 
and related companies have been paid more than $12.8 million from ministry and donor funds. And MacArthur owns three luxury homes worth millions. In one year alone, MacArthur made more than $402,000 for part-time part-time work at his broadcast ministry, Grace to You, and another 103000 from the Master's University and Seminary. This was in addition to in addition to his salary from the megachurch he pastors, Grace Community Church, as well as book royalties and speaking fees. <sighs> what a tangled web we weave. I will put his full video in the description box. I am not aware of the doctrine he teaches, but he sure did his homework on John MacArthur. See, the Most High is peeling back the layers to where Esau and his own people are exposing his iniquity. I did not know John MacArthur was this corrupt. Okay, I always knew about his omission of the gospel, but I really don't have time to look into all these things. But this gentleman did a remarkable job. For a lot of reasons, the Master's University is unique. Just thinking about the current climate, um, on university campuses across the country, we're very different. For one thing, we don't require anyone to be vaccinated. But when asked whether or not people should take it, you had a very soft stance. Something else you'll never hear at the Masters University is social justice, critical race theory, white privilege, white guilt, racial identity. We don't teach that. We don't advocate that. That's not biblical. Uh, yes, it is biblical. Two races of people were marked in Genesis chapter 25, Deuteronomy 28, and uh, most of Leviticus chapter 13. God's intent was to identify those two manner of people because one would be cursed from him for 4,000 years and he would live and die by the sword. The other will go into captivity because of disobedience. And one will be ruling at the end of the world, according to Second Esther 6, verse 9. And the other the kingdom will be established thereafter. Talking about the kingdom of Christ. Christ came from the lineage of Judah. And Christ has his uh, 12 black apostles sitting on thrones beneath his throne okay this is bible this is why the so-called white man is ruling now because he's gonna serve later because of the sin of his forefather esau both jacob and esau were marked because of their perpetual sin okay as yah the most high god desires to warn and deter man from sin and if he needs to identify the sinner by doing that, okay, yes, skin color is important. When I put it in its proper context, he promised to fill Esau's house with blood, since Esau did not hate blood in his violence against Judah. Okay, Revelation chapter 18, verse 17 it gives the Gentile nations a forewarning that all their riches will come to nothing in the day of the Lord. Okay, these people need to be identified and warned, dude. That's the whole purpose of race. And our people need to take consolation and heal, knowing that the Most High Yah will redeem and recompense to our behalf the innocent blood that your forefathers and you have caused us. Look, we all understand that the Bible says we're not to prefer one person over another. That in Christ there's neither bond nor free, male or female, Jew or Gentile, we're all one. You see, they always use that scripture and twist rapture to pre-tribulation rapture to try and escape the judgment. Look, we're all one body in Christ Jesus unto repentance. But repentance does not look the same for everybody, for every generation of people from the sins of their forefathers. Some have to produce more works worthy of repentance. 
because there's, there's a greater sin and causing more uh, uh, so-called believers in Christ to stumble, to depart from the faith. Okay, so there's more repentance required for that. Again, if a guy commits murder, can he be saved? Yes. Is the penalty the same as petty theft? No. If he commits suicide, can he be saved? No. Because that sin sent him into eternity void of repentance. If he commits suicide, he can't repent. You see, so I just broke down to you the simple subject, an example of how all sin is not the same. Revelation describes how these wealthy men will seek suicide and not find it because their life savings came to nothing in one hour. Okay, the scriptures also talk about the sting of death. Preachers like you didn't repair them for the day of the Lord. You taught Luke chapter 6 verse 24 as the moral of the story. Genesis chapter 25 already told you one nation will be stronger than the other, meaning Esau, Esau's faith was always in the tangibles and measurements. Okay, you can't take adversity. You need to control everything. So you even teach your own people inauthentic repentance. You don't tell them that Romans chapter 11 warned the Gentiles that God did not even spare Jacob, the nation he dealt with above all the other nations, whom are like spittle. So be thankful that God used Jacob to graft you Gentiles into the new covenant. Don't lie to us that race is not biblical. Get out of here with that, man. We understand the biblical reality of that, that we are one in Christ. And because we're one in Christ, the last thing we would ever do is divide people up into identity groups in order to satisfy revenge, vengeance, hatred, um, in order to divest people of responsibility for their own lives. Look, sinners want to blame another generation. They want to blame some cultural thing. They want to blame some societal thing for the way they are. Until you accept responsibility for who you are before God, you're not going to be open to the solution to that, which is the gospel which totally transforms you. Right. The gospel should transform you to come up out of them houses, sell everything you own, and give it to the poor, like the rich tax collector Zacchaeus did. Loosen your monopoly on the cemetery schools, which omit the raw, uncut truth of the gospel. Your riches are corrupted. Come up off that slave money. Repent, weeping in tears. That's how your repentance should look. Mine does not look like that because I am not rich <laughs> and I have not stolen anything. Okay? The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. You either do that and inherit eternal life or die with your corrupt earthly inheritance and go to hell. Okay? It sounds like you're the one who refuses to take responsibility and uphold your weight of the gospel. As I said before, most impoverished and even atheistic people are not going to take you seriously until you start cutting some huge checks to random folks who do not look like you. Your forefathers gave Christianity a bad name. Because you used it to build wealth off of the blood money and free labor. So much to the point where even an atheist may question why Christ permitted you to open a church in his name. So don't let your good be evil spoken of. And your exploits of impoverished nations continue to this day. It was our forefathers who grafted you in so that you will have a hope to be saved. Don't nobody owe you jack. Your repentance is not my repentance. What more do you want? 
We understand these things, but our biblical view gives us clarity on the issues that this culture faces today. The gospel, the word of God, the kingdom of light doesn't need any help from the kingdom of darkness. That's the kind of separation that we understand biblically. And that's what's made the Masters University multi-ethnicity all through our campus from all different countries of the world still a place of love and unity in Christ. See how he brought up diversity, multi-ethnicity within the Masters University? This the same game they play with equal opportunity employment in corporate America. And their churches remain full of dead men's bones because revival won't come into them type of churches until them ancient spirits of hatred and murder are cast out. Until then, we got to mark them off as private social clubs. Remember, Christ said, Owe no man nothing but the love of God. He said, go sell everything you own and give it to the poor. He even commanded the disciples not to wear tunics. Okay, in today's modern day world, that would be like Christ telling his disciples not to wear a suit and tie. Okay, you put it off a facade. Okay, Christ was very fixated on how the rich man was dressed in fine linen. Read your scriptures, read your Bible. He, he was fixated how the rich man had nice things and Lazarus evil things. Okay, again, the rich young ruler, he was focused on how he dressed, the things that he had. I just want to close. Ask, ask yourself, what would John MacArthur have been in the 1850s? Because as I said before, those evil ancient spirits reinvent themselves inside their human host. And they do so from generation to generation. A man with this mindset have them same demons of hatred, selfish ambitions. And I can discern from John MacArthur, although he's very calm and well-mannered, I can discern that his grandfather, grandfather MacArthur, definitely gripped that whip in his hand. 